Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA A Plus certification training course on selecting, installing, and troubleshooting CPUs. I'm your host, James Messer. And this module goes through quite a bit, not only deals with what we see in Section 1.3 of our Essentials exam, where we're wanting to troubleshoot CPUs, but also gets into more of the a Technician exam, where we're really trying to install components and make sure that they're working properly. We also want to understand from that, that uh, Technician exam how to recognize problems with CPUs and what we can do to help troubleshoot some of those components. We're going to not only learn about what we need to know about selecting a CPU, but we're going to install one in this module. And I've got a number of software and hardware tweaks that we can do to make sure when we're in a troubleshooting situation that we're able to address any CPU problems. When we start selecting a CPU, we want to think about what software that we're going to need to run on the system. Why are we buying or why are we installing a new system? Is it to browse the net? Is it to perform spreadsheet calculations? Is it to do video type editing that I do a lot of my system? We're going to need to understand what we're trying to do and then work backwards into deciding what type of CPU that we need. We're going to need to think about the computational requirements, if there are any graphical requirements or multimedia pieces we might need to consider. And always keep in mind that the CPU is just one piece of the entire puzzle. We also want to look at video. We also want to look at the front side bus. We also want to understand the speed of our memory and the other components that are in our system. CPU, of course, it is extremely important. But it's not the only thing that we must consider when we're putting together a system. When we're ready to think about using this at a workstation level, we're going to want to understand some of the things I just mentioned. How are we using this system? Is it to do simple browsing, or is it do a little bit higher-end computer-aided design or video production? We also want to think about what the capabilities are of the operating system itself. Are we using a 32-bit operating system? Are we using a 64-bit operating system? Or do we want to use a 64-bit operating system? Because that's also going to have an impact on the type of processor and CPU that we'll need inside of this system. So this is a pretty big decision, too, because 64-bit operating systems are, are extremely functional and very useful. But there are some downsides. Everything on that 64-bit system has to work properly, especially things like device drivers. And because 64-bit systems on the workstation side are not very widespread, you may find there are a number of hardware integration challenges with putting that in. It's a little bit different on the server side. But on the workstation side, sometimes that can be a challenge. You almost have to test it extremely thoroughly before you make a commitment to be sure it's going to work properly in a 64-bit environment. If you're selecting a server, it's a little bit different. There usually is a set purpose for this server. It's going to be a file server. It's going to be an application server. It needs to perform encryption. It needs to do image rendering. It needs to provide streaming video or streaming audio. And usually, a server is designed just for that purpose. You're not really going to change a lot of device drivers in that system. You're not really going to change and load a lot of different applications all the time on that system. Sometimes you'll do multiple things simultaneously. That might have an impact on the speed of the CPU and the type of CPU that you put on that system. You also have to think about with servers, those are devices that you usually have around for quite some time. What are the next plans for that server? Is there a path for this particular application that this is being used for? Is there an upgrade in the future that you're going to need additional horsepower? Maybe you buy a 64-bit server. Even if it's only going to run a 32-bit operating system today, you may have an understanding that a year from now, that application is going to be performing well in a 64-bit environment. So you may already want to have the hardware there and be able to take advantage of that when that is released. These days, installing CPUs is an extremely easy process. You start with the CPU itself. This is my motherboard that has this zero insertion force module, a ZIF module. And it uses this PGA style socket, a pin grid array socket. So there's a couple of words that you'll need to remember for your A plus exam. This is a PGA 370. It's marked right there on the motherboard. I can't go wrong. And most motherboards will have a very clear marking of the type of sockets that's on that motherboard, which fits perfectly with this 1 gigahertz Pentium chip that I happen to have available. Now, you'll also notice that the chip itself has a little marking on the corner. And that marking is very important because that marking correlates to this corner 
of the chip that actually has nothing on it. So you can see they line up pretty well with each other. There's a pin one on both of those. It might have a marking on the motherboard. It might have a black spot. It might have a red mark on the on the pin itself. It might have a, an impression on the socket itself. And you'll you'll see, depending on the socket that you find, you'll see where the socket and pin one and where that, that edge always lines up. What's nice about this, it, if you turned it any other way, it wouldn't fit in the socket anyway. So it's almost dummy proofed for me. So the next step is to pick up the chip and, and before we do that, to grab this bar that's on the side and pull it out. And this is the great part about zero insertion force is that unlocks this so that we can then simply lay the chip into it. No force whatsoever needed to install these CPUs these days. Once that's done, we can then push the bar down and it locks the chip into place very securely, very solidly. You're able to see pretty clearly all the way around and make sure that we really got it into the socket pretty well. There's not much more that you need to know for the installation phase. You simply lay it into the socket, attach it through that zero insertion force. It may have a different type of, of cover on the top. But there's very little force involved. And now your CPU is installed. Now that our CPU is installed, we need to think a lot about how we're going to cool that CPU. CPUs get extremely hot inside of a system. So we want to be sure that we're putting the right things in place to keep the CPU as cool as possible. When the CPU gets too warm, you'll find that you may damage it. and It will certainly cause problems with the system working at all. You may have crashes related to heat. One of the ways to do it is with heat sinks. These are pieces of metal that connect right on top of the chip. Usually you're putting a thermal paste on the bottom of this that puts a really nice connection between the heat sink itself and the chip. They're physically connected there. And usually you'll put a bar right in the middle so it's attached very tightly onto the top of the CPU. What that does is take the heat and spreads it out into these fans uh, and into these fins so that the fans in your system can pull air across the fins and cool the CPU. Very simple in the way that it works. And if you're just using heat sinks, there's really nothing extra you have to add there. It's very silent in the way that it operates. Most of the time these days, you also see fans that attach to the top of the heat sink. So you're not only relying on the fans to pull air through the system, there's a fan sitting directly on top of that CPU heat sink. So you're, you're assured in this particular case that that fan is going to cool that CPU perfectly. And there's usually a place right on the motherboard where you, the fan plugs in to get power. And often the CPU itself will monitor, the motherboard itself will monitor the CPU temperature and adjust the speed of the fan so that the hotter the CPU gets, the faster the fan is going to go. If you're really into doing some experimentation with your system and you're really driving your CPUs to run as quickly as possible, maybe you're doing some overclocking, you may find that you need to cool your system down with a liquid cooling system. And that's a pretty extreme circumstance. You're either in an environment that's really hot or you're doing some type of hobby type work with overclocking where you need to put some liquid cooling directly onto the chip. This is a style of cooling that's really been around since mainframe days. Even today, cool water is used to cool mainframes. You don't see it much in PCs, but there are systems that you can buy right off the shelf to put into your PC. There's even cases that are designed around liquid cooling you can put in. It is involved not only this block on that connects directly onto the CPU, but there's a radiator. What's really happening is all this liquid's being pumped through the system constantly, and the fan is there in the end to cool down the liquid that's inside. There's a coolant, a chemical coolant inside. It's very similar to the coolant you have inside of an automobile that cools it down. Similar type environments, a radiator, you have this chemical coolant. But you need to keep in mind that this is a very poisonous chemical coolant. You don't want to have this around where there's kids or where there's pets because that's a uh, very poisonous if you were happen to drink that. And it's usually marked and colored with a green color so that you know that that's a dangerous liquid to have around the, the house. It, this is also a liquid. And again, we're putting this into a computer. And computers and liquid, if that was to leak out in any way, that really wouldn't go together too well. So also something to keep in mind if you're planning to do something like this in your system. If you ever get to a point where you're wondering if the CPU is your problem, then you're going to want to go through some troubleshooting steps to deal with that. The nice part about CPUs is their solid state technology. There's no moving parts, really. There is down at the, uh, the subatomic level where you've really got a lot of electrons moving back and forth. 
but really the solid state technology. There's no moving fans. It's not like a hard drive where there's motors involved. When you install the CPU, it's either going to work or it's not going to work. And it's because when you installed it, maybe it's the wrong type of CPU. Maybe it's an older style motherboard where you have to set the voltage. But when you turn on the system, your motherboard's probably going to beep at you and let you know that it doesn't recognize the CPU that's there or there's a problem associated with the CPU. It's very rare that a CPU would go bad. That, that is probably one of the last things that you would ever need to swap out of a system if you were troubleshooting an environment. If you are having a problem with a CPU you just installed, check the connection. If it's a, a older slot-based system or one that you had to put into with a little bit of force, check and make sure that it's in there really well. If it's a zero insertion force module, usually those go in pretty well. But you can always check to make sure it got in there and it's laying completely flat inside the connection. If you still aren't quite sure, there's a program you could download called CPU Burn-In. This was really designed for people doing overclocking. And you can take your CPU and run it up to extremely high levels. So it's really burning it in. You can specify how long you'd like it to go to see if your system is going to fail or not. That's a, a version that's both in a Windows version and there's a Linux version of that as well. And I've got that users.bigpond.net.au. So this is in Australia with a slash CPU burn right after that. That's the URL you can go to to download that. There's other utilities you can get. This one's called CPU uh, CPU ID, it's a hardware monitor. Uh, CPU ID hardware monitor checks for the temperature inside your system, not just of your CPU, but it, as you can see here in my system, it's also monitoring other components like my hard drive components and my video. So if there's a way to see what the values are of those temperatures, this is hardware monitor is a great way to do that. Maybe you run this hardware monitor the same time you're running the burn in to see at what point we can really take the heat of that CPU. How high does it go? Is the fan working the way we would expect? Do we need to add another fan into the system? If we do add another fan, what impact is it going to have on the temperature? And you can monitor all of that with the CPU hardware monitor. And finally, here's a utility that I mentioned in an earlier video, but it's still extremely useful to understand exactly what type of CPU happens to be in a system. And it's called CPU-Z, also from CPUID.com. There's the URL on the screen. And this is uh, CPU information that will tell you more than maybe you'd ever want to know about what's running inside of a system, especially if this is a laptop environment. And many laptops will support many different kinds of CPUs. This is a great way that you can pull it open. It even adds in the little icon for the type of CPU you happen to have in there and gives you a lot of information about exactly the type of uh, CPU you have and the type of CPU cache that's associated with what's installed in your system. In review, we've gone through the things you want to think about when you're selecting a CPU. I've shown you how easy it is these days to install a CPU and some of the things you need to think about when you're cooling these CPUs, especially in an environment that's very warm or something that's going to be using a lot of CPU processing power. And finally, showed you some utilities you can use to not only see what your CPU is doing, but if you ever need to do some troubleshooting, they come in very handy there as well. For more A-plus videos, to participate in our message boards, to add some things to our study guide wiki, feel free to visit our website at freeaplus.com.